Now, you know, and also in your book, Money, the Twelfth and Final Religion, do you have some comparisons there that you make with Moloch? Well, yeah, because uh, it's an accident. <laughs> Discovering the Moloch was an accident. Um, I wrote the book and I sort of stumbled on this and I said, well, I don't want to become, I'm not going to be a critic of religions because I, you know, people's religions matter and they work uh, for that person. And so there's no, well, I don't have an argument with religions and I didn't want to discover another God. But anyway, the first reviewer of the book on Amazon wrote a terrific review. It's been done away with now. It's not there now. But he said, he pointed out that I discovered two gods. And I'd been denying that for the whole period. And finally, I said, I'll just fess up. I'll say, okay, I've just, there is another god. A parallel and simultaneous god that's simultan parallel with the salvation god. In other words, the the uh, sin, guilt, salvation uh, dogma of, of uh, Christianity has an alternative and simultaneous God, which is the Mulak, which is perpetual debt, money and interest, and stock exchanges. And so I'm forcing myself to accept that, and they run simultaneously, but one hides within the other one. The, the Mulak hides in plain sight, and whereas the the church God, Christian God, can forgive, and he's always redeeming and coming back and and rescuing his followers. But the Mulak is quite different. There's no pardon and no forgiveness ever. And uh, but that's how money works. Money doesn't pardon and money doesn't forgive. And uh, and you have to have a belief system. Uh, now. In the belief in a religious, in any of the religions, they've got a certain set of beliefs which are genuine and essential to the believer. Where the Mulak is quite simple. You've got to believe one thing. You've got to believe that money, unlike anything else on the planet, can grow without air, earth, water, or sunlight. You take your $100 to the bank, they lock it in an airtight vault, and they say it's going to pay 6%. Come back a year later, you get $106. How'd that happen? <laughs> That's too crazy for, the, for common sense. But that belief mechanism has taken over the mind like a psychic fire. It's, you know, it's been around for 2,000 years now. And uh, I like to toy with the Bible stories and and examine where it happened and how it happened. And uh, so interest on money is like the fire in the burning bush. The burning bush burns, but it does not consume. Money creates interest, but it does not consume the money itself, the principle. So you've got the same psychological experience and uh, so that was my, my interpretation of Moses at the bush. He's discovering interest on money. And uh, I've toyed with that a little bit, not too much. But the story of money is in the, in the, actually in the Bible, in Genesis 47, where I guess it's Joseph gets to work for the Pharaoh and uh, gets to be a big deal. And... Uh, he takes over the operating of the, and Ankhenaten is the, uh, is the uh, pharaoh. And Ankhenaten discovers Israel. Now, what he calls Israel is photosynthesis. Now, he didn't like the way his country was run with three different religions. The, the sun was a religion, and there was... Isis, and then there was El. So there's three dominant religions, and these they all have priesthoods that are taking up his time and his property and his money for his wealth. So he thought about it one day and looked at the sun and said, well, there's a, there's a power of the sun that supports all life. 
and the word he used, the phonetic he used to describe it was Israel. So the word Israel gets appropriated through different phases to be misunderstood as a place. And uh, But anyway, while he's doing all that, Joseph, the uh, executive, is doing razzle-dazzle in the uh, in the empire and uh, the seven lean years and the seven fat years and uh, how does he do it? First he goes to the people and uh, what did I, I have it somewhere in my, I, to read. <laughs> I wrote it, but it's, oh no you, problem. If you read the story in the, in Genesis 47, it explains exactly what happened? How there was uh, <clears throat> the people have to, the people are part of the Pharaoh's family. But Joseph goes in there and tells them, no, you don't need to do that. You gotta, you gotta borrow this money. And the way that it worked at the time is all property all transactions were done goods for goods. In other words, I would break you, uh, bring you a, a, a pail of wheat and you'd give me a liter of wine or something like that. There was always good for goods. And you had to, it had to be authenticated at the temple. So in order for our deal to be binding, you would have to go to the temple. And, uh, the, the scribe would make a little notation on a on a uh, little clay tablet about the size of the palm of your hand, I guess, and he would note that I gave you a bushel of wheat and you gave me a liter of wine, and so that was so it was legal, so it was binding, and that's how all trade was done, and if. For instance, if you had something that you wanted to get rid of and I wanted it, we would say, okay, but I don't have uh, a liter of wine right now. I won't, go, I won't have any wine until August. So we'd go to the temple. You would give me whatever we were talking about, a puppy, let's say, or a chicken. And he would mark down, the priest would make a little clay tablet, one puppy in exchange for one liter of wine due in August. So then he'd take that tablet and put it ahead on the shelf to the month of August. So in August, he'd go look at those tablets and say, ah, this turkey's got to come up with a liter of wine. So that's how all trade was done at that time. And, and uh, at that time also, the temple had all sorts of different weights, little, uh, Felspar, little stone weights, and that's how they portioned out the seed for the farmers and for it to be paid. In other words, if you worked in the field, you'd come in at the end of the day to get your handful of grain, which was your your pay. And depending on your standing in the merit of the workers, it would depends on how much grain you would be given. So they had to have a separate weight for each category of worker. Now visualize this as a young scribe trying to become a priest. You had to memorize all those things and you had to know all the different categories of workers so that when they came in you gave them the right amount of pay. <laughs> Just a marvelous system. But you can imagine how much work that would be for the young priest or young scribe who wanted to grow up and be a priest someday. And uh, so nobody's ever figured out really how that worked, but it's pretty obvious that, that, that it did work and it worked well. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty fascinating if you think about it. It certainly would take a lot of work. Now that you've got computers and tracking systems, I think it could be easier to deal with that type of situation, but certainly uh, I could see a lot being involved with that. Yeah, well, our buddy Joseph, 
he's he can do all that. He's really smart. And uh, so he gets in there and he says, and there were seven good years and seven bad years. And during the good years, Joseph collects all the surplus into inventory. And in the bad years, he sells the inventory back to the people, the, fame, the same people who created it in the first place. Now the implication is that there was money involved at that time, that money had already been created because they had to pay for the inventory they were getting. And this is the first experience of money transaction that we can in, in, interpret from scripture. And it must have come as a, and it's a real shock to the Egyptians because prior to that time, when they were just members of the Pharaoh's household, you put it in inventory and then you get it back. Well, they put it in inventory, Joseph had acquired it, and now they wanted, it. He, he wouldn't give it back to them unless they paid money for it. So they had to get money. And not only that, but Joseph was selling the surplus inventory to his family, which was coming from uh, Palestine. And that must have created a certain tension. And not only that, his family had been in Egypt. He brought, he brought his family to Egypt to look after the Egyptians' cattle. So the only thing that the only asset that the Egyptian people had left was their cattle under the supervision of Joseph's relatives. <laughs> so, so what they do is that uh, they have famine, they get a famine. So they have to eat the cattle. So you're running out, you got nothing, you got, you, all you have left is your land. You're an Egyptian, all you have left is your land. You've used up everything else. And <laughs> so they have to trade their, what's left of their cattle for bread to live. Well, they're at the end of the line. You know, they've, they've got nothing left. So what do they have to do? They have to get seed to plant to uh, grow a crop to survive with. And uh, so what he does was he takes all the last of their money. There's no more money left in the in the in the economy now because they they had to buy the seed to plant to survive. So the Egyptians and money systems even today misunderstand what happened. They say the money system failed. No, the money system did not fail. It worked perfectly. It collected all the money in one place. And that's how money systems work. They just iterate until it all goes into one place. And then there's a crisis of some kind. But the upshot of it is that Joseph is now in charge. He owns it. Instead of the Pharaoh being the head guy, Joseph is the head guy. So he's introduced himself as a third party between the traditional monarch and the people. So he's introduced finance for the first time. And just like the central bank, now the Federal Reserve, is, a, is an intermediary between government and the people. So nothing's changed in 2,000 years 